One of the oldest methods for cooling dates all the way back to the Egyptians, where they would hang wet reeds over the doorways. And as that dry desert air would blow across those wet reeds, the water would evaporate, changing state from a liquid to a vapor. As it did that, that was a cooling effect. It actually was able to cool off those houses. That is still relevant today. If you remember earlier, we talked about B2 as a heat energy and changing water from a liquid to a vapor from 212 degrees liquid to 212 degrees vapor took 970 B2 as a energy to make it change state. That water changing state kept it at a cool 212 degrees Fahrenheit. But if we really look at evaporation at a lower temperature than that, I can have evaporation right now depending on the humidity in this room. As I take water at, say, 80 degrees Fahrenheit at very low humidity, making this one pound of water change state from a liquid to a vapor, that's over a thousand BTUs of heat transfer. In other words, I can take the heat from the air, take a thousand BTUs out of that heat from the air, and make it for this water to change state from a liquid to vapor. The heat did not disappear. It simply went from sensible heat into latent heat. The humidity goes higher inside the house, but also the temperature goes down. So the heat doesn't disappear. We just moved it from sensible heat of the air to latent heat coming back out. Now let's look at that B2 factor. It takes 13.33 cubic feet of air to have one pound of air. So essentially all of these cubic feet of air, that would be about one pound of air. It only takes point 24 BTUs to change one pound of air one degrees Fahrenheit. Heck, it took one B2 to change one pound of water one degrees Fahrenheit, but it only takes a quarter of a BTU to change one pound of air one degrees Fahrenheit. Let's look at what one full BTU would do. If I had one full BTU, that would be four pounds of air, four times this much. It would also be 55 cubic feet of air. So only one BTU would change 55 cubic feet of air one degrees Fahrenheit. It's quite impressive, but what would a thousand BTUs do? So if I had a thousand BTUs, I could change 55,000 cubic feet of air one degrees Fahrenheit. 55,000 cubic feet. That's a lot of air one degree. The problem is changing the air one degree really doesn't do much for us. So what if we change the air much more? What if I took the air and changed the air temperature 30 degrees. Let's say the air is coming in at 100 degrees and I cool it all the way down to 70 degrees coming out, which is absolutely possible. It's still a thousand BTUs for every one pound of water changing state. If we look at that math wise, a thousand BTUs dropping the temperature 30 degrees, we could drop 1,833 cubic feet of air, 30 degrees. 1,833 cubic feet, of air, that's a lot of air we could drop that 30 degrees Fahrenheit. So let's look at some areas with some very dry climate, like El Paso, Texas, Southern New Mexico, Arizona, Nevada, Southern California. Anywhere with a desert climate, the humidity is gonna be very low. So we could absolutely cool the air from 100 degrees coming in to 70 degrees coming out. We could take that heat and make the heat change from sensible heat into latent heat. The heat doesn't disappear. It's still going to be inside the air. The difference is it's going to be in latent heat where you can't see it. The air is sensibly cooler. We can measure the thermometer, but it's now hidden heat. It's hidden in humidity. It made the humidity go up. So that works out really, really impressive. So if we had this evaporative cooler running in Las Vegas, 100 degrees outside, moving the air through, the water is changing state from liquid to vapor, absorbing sensible heat out of the air, moving it into latent heat that we can't see as humidity inside the house. And we can absolutely cool the house. The problem is, as the temperature of the air gets too high, we end up with a higher temperature blowing into the house. So if the air is 120 degrees, now the air coming out is only, say, 90 degrees. Well, who wants to be comfortable at 90 degrees? Nobody. So at that point, they start losing their function. They don't work as well at those peak times of summer. That's where central air conditioning comes into play. Now, central air conditioning works great and evaporative cooling works great under a dry climate, but we can't run them both at the same time. We have to run this one or the other one. And the reason being is because now we're putting humidity into the air. The heat's still there. It's late heat. It's hidden, but we have higher humidity. The central air conditioners having to take this 
latent heat from the air, this high humidity, squeeze it back out of the air and put it into condensate draining outside. So it's going to take a thousand BTUs of energy from your air conditioner to pull that moisture back out. So it would constantly be fighting each other. You'd be putting moisture in, you got to be taking that air back out. It would be a nonstop battle. So you'd only run one or the other. But you can definitely run this one in, say, the spring and fall and when it's still warm, and you can have much less energy cooling your house. And then when it got to where it wasn't working, you could switch over to your central system. Another benefit of this is we're running water on this constantly. That air coming in, the particles, the dust, the pollens get trapped in that water. They drain down to the bottom, and it's a really great way of filtering the air. Now, the problem with this is I have to constantly be bringing dry outside air in. So this is installed outside. We're blowing it into the house. So we have to leave windows in the house open all around. If we shut the windows, we can't push any air in the house. So we have to have those windows open at least a little bit. So we're constantly bringing in outside air. We're cooling that air down by evaporation change of states. And then we're constantly moving that air out of the house on the other side. And it does work well under those conditions. But what would happen if you put this entire unit inside of the house completely? Well, at first it would work great because as the air is dry, that dry air is causing a lot of water to change state from liquid to vapor. It would cool off. But the thing is the humidity in the house goes up. And as the humidity goes up, you end up with less and less evaporation and eventually get to the point where the humidity in the house is so high, you don't have any evaporation. And you also end up with so much moisture, you get moisture on the walls, moisture in electronics. And once you get over 60% relative humidity, you also end up with growth happening inside the house. There are certain types of mold and you end up with lots of odors and you would literally be inside of a swamp. At that point, it would definitely absolutely be a swamp cooler. So this has to be located outside the house, blowing air inside the house with a method for the air to get back out of the house, such as little open windows. What would happen if I installed this in a non-dry climate, a humid climate, such as Florida, for example? Well, the air in Florida is already full of moisture. There'd be very little evaporation, very little change of state. Because there's very little evaporation, there'd be very little cooling going on. It'd actually be increasing the humidity of the air going inside. And Florida is so humid, it may not even be able to do that. But at that point, the humidity would be so high inside the house, the smells would be horrible. It would literally smell like a swamp. And that's how they got the name Swamp Cooler, because people tried installing these in climates that were too humid. If it's over 50% humidity, these aren't going to work very well. And the higher the humidity is, the worse that smell is going to be, because you remember, you're putting more moisture in. So if the humidity is 50% outside, you're going to be increasing the humidity inside the house. Once you get over 60%, you end up with the smells, the odors, and also your body doesn't cool as well. Your body also cools by evaporation, change of state from a liquid to vapor of the moisture in your skin for cooling effect. So as the humidity in your house goes up, you're going to feel more and more uncomfortable. So installing this in a humid climate, absolutely going to be a bad thing. That's going to be a swamp cooler. Another problem is maintenance. If we don't have this thing maintained and serviced, it's definitely going to end up with things growing inside of it. We must treat the water inside, we must treat the pump, we must take care of this, because if we let that stuff build up, you're gonna end up with a swamp here, and when you turn it on, it's gonna blow that swamp smell inside of the house. So when you hear people talk about it, a swamp cooler, I think swamp cooler means it's installed in the wrong climate, or it hasn't been serviced or maintained properly, and we need to fix that, because the true name of this is evaporative cooling because of evaporation. It's a very, very important part of everything that we do. Now, this isn't the only way that we cool. You've probably seen products like this being sold. Hey, this little desk cooler, room cooler, cools up to so much. They really have great marketing, but we know we should never trust marketing because even though this is a great product, it's been marketed for the wrong reasons totally. So if we look at this whole thing, all this is is an evaporative cooler. You lift the lid, you pour water in, it lets that water soak through the material and we have a fan. As we pull dry air across this, that water evaporates, changes state from liquid to vapor, latent heat, it actually cools the air coming off. But nowadays, most people live where we have refrigerated air conditioning. So what happens when I take this component and I install it inside of my desk where the humidity is already at 50%? Well, now as we have evaporation taking place and this air may or may not be that much cooler blowing on me, we increase the humidity inside the house. As we increase the humidity, the air conditioner is having to work harder, taking it back from a vapor to a liquid, draining it back outside the house. And if you tried using this inside of your camper, it'd be bad because it'd be the same scenario installing this inside of the house. As I put this inside of a, say, a camper, 
even if it's a dry climate, at first we're going to have evaporation. But what's going to happen to the humidity inside the camper? The humidity is going to go up and up and up, and eventually you're not going to have any cooling taking place, and you're going to end up in a swamp condition. It's going to be high humidity. It's going to be very uncomfortable. However, let's think about the right application. I spent a good part of my time in Las Vegas living in a desert. I spent one entire desert just living out of my truck camper, and it's open. There's lots and lots of ventilation. What I did was I kept one of these water bottle. I would fill it up. I used my little battery pack, and I would have this where it's blowing across my face. My camper had a screen on it. It was very open, lots of air change, and all I needed was cool air blowing across my face, across my body. It dropped the temperature. I could easily get to sleep, and about midnight or so, I'd have to wake up to use the bathroom anyways. I'd put me another pound of water in here, and I would have enough cooling to continue my comfortable night's sleep all the way until the morning. And in a desert, usually after midnight, the temperature of the air starts dropping anyways. So even though it was over 100 degrees, I could sleep very comfortably with this. But the catch was, it wasn't a sealed room. Number two, it was a very dry climate. Number three, I had to make sure I kept us cleaned out so we didn't end up with any kind of a swamp scenario happening. So under those conditions, it works great. Although as a company selling these, that's a very small window of customers. So if you make a whole bunch of these and you market it that it cools everybody for cheaper, then you end up with a lot of unhappy people and a company that made a lot of money for a short period of time. So if you're camping out in the desert, this is a great way. It uses very little energy that you can blow cooler in your face. A lot of times it's just enough so you can get to sleep, but it will not work in a camper and it's not gonna work inside of a house. It's only gonna work if you have low humidity and enough volume to where you're gonna continue to have low humidity. And the science behind this continues. If you think about those little rags that they sell, keeps you cool, you wet it and it keeps you cool. It does work great in a dry climate. So in Las Vegas, you dip that in the water, put it around your neck. As evaporation takes place, that water change state from a liquid to vapor, 1,000 BTUs per pound, it cools your body very, very effectively. You wear that same thing in Florida and all it is is an extra heat because that water is not evaporating. It just soaks up the heat from your body and makes you more and more miserable. But understanding the power and importance of evaporation applies to how you're going to be working. If you're going to be working on a roof in a dry climate, absolutely put those things around your neck. It'll help keep you cool. In Florida, you may want to skip that because it's probably not going to be helping you that much. But understanding evaporation, it's simply water changing state from liquid to vapor. It's that latent heat effect. If you have a lot of moisture, you're going to have very little evaporation. If you have very little moisture in the air, you have more evaporation, more cooling. But it's really cool how that works all the way back to the Egyptians. They understood those basic concepts and really it still applies today. Now, if you come back, we're going to do another video about how this system works, how these components work, and all the engineering that goes into this, how to service it and maintain this to get as much life out of it as possible.